people, as a general rule, they they tend to have a short memory when it comes to the things that have been done for them. How you've helped them. When you've helped them. When you've come alongside them in a difficult time. Or they may remember for a little while, but it doesn't last long. People tend to have a long memory when it comes to having been done wrong. When it comes to even having perceived that they've been slighted or insulted or betrayed. For some reason, it's not hard to remember those for years on end. Those memories, for whatever reason, they last a long, long time. The helping fades quickly. The hurting endures for years. The words of love and support seem to be gone with the morning dew, and the words that cut or scar, they bounce around like one of those little rubber super balls inside a empty oil tanker. Now, I don't know if you've thought about it or not, but that simple reality, that simple truth about our condition goes a long way to explaining our behavior. The hurts and insults we seem to remember forever the help, the love, the words of encouragement, the coming alongside, it just seems to drift away. You know, Jesus, he said, do not judge others and you will not be judged, for you'll be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. In Luke chapter 6, Jesus said, Do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you'll be forgiven. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you and full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. It was the Apostle Paul, interestingly enough, it was the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 who said, You may think you can condemn such people, but you are just as bad and you have no excuse. When you say that they are wicked and should be punished, you are condemning yourself. For you who judge, judge others do these very same things. Excuse me, that's chapter 2. And... We know that God in his justice will punish anyone who does such things. Since you judge others for doing these things, why do you think you can avoid God's judgment when you do the same things? I'm going to try to connect the dots here in just a second, but a couple more passages for you. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, 
Don't judge by his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And then lastly, from Proverbs chapter 27, verse 19. As a face is reflected in water, so the heart reflects the real person. So let me see if I can boil these five passages down for us real quick. Starting with the last one. The heart reflects the real person, who each of us really is. But according to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, none of us gets to see the heart, so we don't know the real person. The only person who actually sees the heart is God. So no matter, no matter how witty we think we are, no matter how clever we think we are, no matter how many books we think we've read, we don't have anybody pegged because we don't see the heart. So not only are these passages saying that to know the real person, you've got to be able to see the heart, and you can't see the heart because you're not God. So you don't really know the real person, but you don't even really know yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because between your biases and your prejudice and your self-deception, you can't even see your own heart. Mm -hmm. Which should suggest to us that when the Holy Spirit of God tells you something about yourself, you ought to believe Him. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because you don't know. If anything, that should give us some sense of, well, humility. So if the Holy Scriptures are correct, which I believe they are, then we're commanded by Jesus not to judge others. Why? Because we don't know the whole story, because we'll get it wrong. You know, one of my favorite sayings is, don't judge my life by the chapter you walked in on. Because there's a lot that came before you met me, and there's still a long way to go to the end. Jesus says that the standard you use for judging someone else will be the standard Jesus uses in judging you. And we've just established that since you don't know the heart, you don't know the real person, and since you don't know the real person, you don't know the real story, and so that means there's actually no time or place where you have the right to judge. Don't have bitterness and resentment against someone and refuse to forgive them because no matter what's been done to you, it's nothing compared to how you have dishonored God. Mm. So that means you owe God a national debt. I mean, just think about it. That's really what each one of us owes. That's what's been forgiven for us. If you think about every sin we've ever committed, every thought, every selfish act, every moment when we've known to do right and we've opted to do wrong, every time we've harmed someone, even just with a, a look, every single time when you add all that up, that's like you and me owing God the national debt. And so the scripture says, you know, since he's forgiven you that much, then how big of a deal can you really make when someone hurts you, no matter how bad it is. Don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you you pretend like, pretend like you've not been hurt. I mean, forgiveness is a progress, is, is a process, but l l let's be certain. Jesus is saying, you, you don't have the right to refuse to forgive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ever. 
listen to these words again. I just want to read them slowly again, okay? Luke chapter 6, verse 37 and 38. Do not judge others and you will not be judged. Do not condemn others or it will all come back against you. Forgive others and you will be forgiven. Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full. Press down, shake them together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount that you get back. Now please forgive me if it seems that I'm belaboring the point, but I really want us to get this firm in our mind, okay? Again, the Apostle Paul, which you'll find interesting in a moment. Ephesians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who, only live, who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest every everlasting life from the Spirit. Now, anyone who's ever lived in the country and done any planting at all knows this principle. And even if you're a city kid, you probably have figured out this principle. It, it, you harvest what you plant. All right? So if you plant soybeans, you will not harvest corn. You just won't. <laughs> If you plant winter wheat, you will not harvest tobacco, no matter how hard you pray. <coughs> it just will not happen. You reap what you sow. So, then, it only makes sense that if you plant bitterness, you will not harvest joy, no matter how much you ask for it. If you plant envy, you will not harvest contentment. And if you plant unforgiveness, do not expect forgiveness to come up. Because that's not what you planted. And believe it or not, all these words, all this stuff that I've just mentioned to you, they have an incredible bearing on our understanding of this passage in Acts chapter 15. See, something extraordinary happens at the end of Acts 15 that demonstrates quite clearly the great challenge of our human condition and our struggle as a community. Now, we've been talking in the book of Acts for now two years and three weeks, I think, or something like that. And Acts 15 is pretty much the middle of the book. And we're getting to the end of the middle of the book. And we've talked for the last three or four weeks, at least, about Acts chapter 15. So... Who remembers what's going on in Acts 15? This is the part where you get to participate. You don't, have, you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have all the answers, and you don't have to have it memorized. But help me out, brothers and sisters. It, it does a pastor's heart when somebody, anybody, remembers something that he said in four or five weeks. Please. The, 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 the Jewish converts to Christ are still acting on in, their own instinct, right? Because you said one time that it's hard to change, well, whatever the right thing is. So you can't change what you've been doing your whole life. So that's why I use the word instinct. Yep. Right, and then, so then there's, there's a discussion about it, and it's a serious, deep discussion about it. And then Peter, Barnabas, and Paul, and then James, they all have something to say about each thing. It's about the grace of God. Peter's the grace of God. Paul and Barnabas are about the 
Gentiles, both what we see Job doing for the Gentiles, and James, the middle brother, is going, laying it out for you straight up. I have always loved you, Mike. <laughs> always. <laughs> Seriously. Good, good teaching, man. <laughs> May the Lord bless you for generations to come. <laughs> okay, somebody else. Anything you would add to that? Because that was good. He gave us kind of an outline, some of it. But there's some that we could fill in here. What do you remember about Acts chapter 15? What's Acts chapter 15 about? Yes, ma'am. In part, it's about um, accepting um, those, accepting Gentiles. In part, it's about um, breaking from tradition. And, and there was a lot about, uh, um, I forgot what you call what you do to a guy. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, I was about to go through like pictures here. Um, so anyway. I, I can't tell you how happy I am <laughs> that you did not describe circumstances. Sorry. I've been through it once. It was enough. <laughs> uh, but there's a big deal in their culture about circumcision. And, um, and, and that's one of the core it's one of the core big things that make the difference in their lives. Right. And so now we're saying all of a sudden, no, you don't have to be circumcised. And, um, and so for them, it's like it creates a big ref because they're having a really hard time accepting that. Right. Right. So it's like pulling. It's like you're. It's like if you have a bandage over something that's healing, but it's oozed some stuff, and then you're kind of pulling at it. And it's like, what? I don't see how this is amusing. Just, they're just thinking about dessert. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. But anyway, so for them, it's like pulling away at a sore because it's like more and more things are being taken from them that they feel are specific to their culture and made them unique that is in that capacity. That's excellent. what I was trying to say. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Very good. I'm going to do your wedding. <laughs> Somebody else. Just know what Tanya was sharing. It made me think about the fact that of the, the the owner, the landowner that hired people at different hours of the day, and the ones who were hired in the, for the full day got the same pay as the ones who showed up an hour later, and mm. they weren't happy about it. Mm. That's right. Circumcision for the Jewish community is kind of the same way they want to impose that rule onto the Gentiles. Right. And not just circumcision, but all the laws yeah. of God. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right? Because they, they have spent their lives obeying 613 different rules, Yeah. right? Yeah. And that thing that Mike was talking about was the, the neuropaths, right? That pattern of behavior that creates such a deep pattern in us that it's hard to break away from. So even though they've become followers of Jesus, it's hard for them to break away from this entire lifestyle. And so instead of them breaking away from it, they say, well, why don't these Gentiles join us? Especially because, right, the Gentiles in Antioch of Syria are known for having a lot of gods and are known for having, you know, prostitutes at the temple that they sleep with as a sacrifice to gods and being just actually more godless than anything, their behavior, uncivilized, mm -hmm. all of that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when the Jews look over at them, it's only natural they think, we need to civilize those people. Mm -hmm. Now, we know we're not going to colonize those people because we're just, you know, under oppression ourselves, but we need to at least civilize those people. And that's when we came to the recognition that one of the most important things about Acts chapter 15 is the <coughs> issue of segregation over integration. Mm -hmm. The reason that segregation is so easy is because it's part of the fall. 
the reason we're able to say, well, segregation is natural is because it comes with the brokenness of our world. And actually what makes Acts chapter 15 so difficult is reversing it. It's fighting for integration. Bringing two different peoples together as one. And it takes effort and it takes energy. And this isn't the first time they've tried. And it's not going to be the final word on it, right? That's what we know about Acts chapter 15. Now, James is obviously, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. And he navigates this minefield with near perfection. He's, he's become the head of the council there at the first church, the church in Jerusalem, right? And I, I was reminded, and this, this was kind of cool for me this week when I was thinking about it. You know, James, I mean, it's, he had to be incredibly savvy to navigate this entire council and conversation and issue and not have the whole thing blow apart. And then it occurred to me, that this James is the exact same James who wrote in his epistle, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And I thought to myself, I wonder if this council is where he learned that, to just ask God for wisdom. Because this thing was so far beyond him. And sure enough, he uses wisdom. And it's an amazing sentence. You know, if you need wisdom, no matter how much you've been a knucklehead, God will give it to you. I mean, that's what the promise is. Right? Mm -hmm. he, he gives generously to all without finding fault. I mean, because every time I ask God for wisdom... He could pause and say, yeah, do you remember how you lost your cool? Or do you remember when you thought that? Or you were critical about that? Or you did that or you didn't do that? I mean, there's, there's a million reasons why he could say, I'm not giving you wisdom. You need to clean your act up. But he gives me his wisdom. He gives us wisdom to help us clean our act up. He gives us wisdom so that we'll know how to honor him. That's what wisdom is, right? God wants us to have wisdom. And so I have to believe that James was asking the Lord for a lot of wisdom, and basically James comes up with a good process for resolving this conflict concerning do Gentiles have to act like Jews to be accepted into the church? The first thing he does is James, he brings all the stakeholders together, you can tell I've worked with government in these last few years. <laughs> Stakeholders. <laughs> yes. And then the second thing he does, which is interesting enough, he, he lets the plaintiffs go first. He lets those who have the complaint about how people are behaving or aren't behaving go first. And it's interesting to me that Luke doesn't even bother telling us what they said. He just said they talked for a really long time. That's, that's what Luke tells us right there, right? Mm. And so the Pharisees who've become Christians, they talk and they give their side. And they tell how they've not been appreciated and all of those sorts of things. And then James calls on the apostle with the most credibility, Peter, who talks about grace, as Mike said, how he was commanded by God to go and lead a Roman officer. Okay? The conquering, oppressing army. To lead a Roman officer to Christ. And sure enough, he does it. And he talks about how God's grace is for everybody. And then it's backed up with step four. When Barnabas and Paul, the two apostles, who spent the last three years starting churches in Gentile country saying this is what's happened in the Gentile cities that we've been in and this is how we've seen the Holy Spirit work. And then James, he lands the plane and gives his judgment in favor of the work of the Holy Spirit by citing scripture to back it up. So from 
a leadership and a conflict resolution kind of perspective, it's a nice piece of work for James. I mean, that's, it's impressive. You can, you, you can admire that piece of work for a long time. And then, to make it official, what he does is he writes it all up and he sends two delegates, both prophets, Silas and Judas Barsabbas. By the way, if Judas Barsabbas might sound a little bit familiar to you, it's because there's a possibility that his brother, Joseph Barsabbas, was the guy who got passed by as the 12th disciple back in chapter 1. You remember when Luke spent all that time identifying the guy just to say that he was the loser? He didn't, he didn't get to be the 12th disciple, that it was Matthias, remember? Well, this it, Judas Barsabbas. Barsabbas means uh, son of the Sabbath, but there's a pretty good shot that it's not a coincidence here that you've got Judas and Joseph. And so Judas... Barsabbas and Silas, they're both prophets, and so they're sent, and James sends them to read the pronouncement, and the Gentiles are accepted into the church and family, and everyone is filled with joy, and integration is agreed upon, and all seems well with the world. In fact, Silas and Judas, they stick around for a while, they stay there in Antioch of Syria and they teach the, the believers. They try to, to strengthen the faith and those sorts of things. And it looks like this should be the place where everything ends, right? A Acts chapter 15, if I look just at verse 30, let me just read that part so you know I'm not telling, lying to you. The, verse 30, the messengers went at once to Antioch. When they called a general meeting of the believers and delivered the letter, and there was great joy throughout the church that day as they read this encouraging message. Then Judas and Silas, both being prophets, spoke at length to the believers, encouraging and strengthening their faith. They stayed for a while, and then the believers sent them back to the church in Jerusalem with a blessing of peace. Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch, they and many others taught and preached the word of the Lord. Fade to black, roll the credits, end of the chapter. We all live happily ever after. That is how this chapter should end, man. They've done all this work. They've got to integration. I mean, cool things are about to happen. Just cut it there. Except I don't know if you've read much of Luke, but Luke does not seem to like happy endings. <laughs> and if you don't believe me, wait till we get to chapter 28. You're going to say, what happened to the rest of it when he just ends in midair? But Luke, he's not big on having it all resolve. I mean... He's taken his time and he's shown us that integration takes work and he's shown us that it can happen. And now that there is the appearance of unity, Luke finishes with a fight between two of the best known apostles <laughs> in all of the book of Acts. <laughs> See, like I said, he's not big on stories that just finish and resolve with the happily ever after because you see Luke he lived in the real world just like the rest of us and he knows that it doesn't ever end that way it keeps going there's always another conflict coming always now if you don't believe me all you have to do is read uh, Luke chapter 15 where Jesus is telling the story of the father who has two sons. Mm -hmm. Now, I know some people think of it as the story of the prodigal son, but that's not accurate. It's the father who has two sons, and his youngest son says, Dad, give me my inheritance. I am tired of waiting for you to kick off. And sure enough, that's what happens. The dad gives him his inheritance. He goes off. He spends it in wild living. He finally comes to his senses. Jesus tells us the story that he's coming back down the road because he's going to humble himself, confess to his dad that he's an absolute idiot. 
all of those sorts of things. But the dad, because he's been watching for him and he's been waiting for him, sees his son coming down the road, goes running to him, embraces him, restores him. There's reconciliation. There's forgiveness. He invites him in. He's gained him back from Death to life, that is the words he uses to describe what it's like, giving his boy back, and he throws a party. But then, when that should be the end, and it should be happily ever after, then Luke says, except the older brother comes down, and he finds out that the younger brother's inside, and there's a party going on, and he's absolutely ticked. And he promises, he says that he always obeys his dad while he disobeys him and says, no, I won't come in and celebrate. (laughs) And it's there that Luke ends the story. It never resolves. We don't know what happens with the older brother. We don't know if the dad goes back in without him. We don't know if the two brothers are reconciled. We don't know. Because the story just ends. The same is true of Luke when he's talking about Jesus in the desert, when he's tempted in Luke chapter 4. He's, in Luke chapter 4, he, he talks about how, how Jesus has been tempted, and he finally, he's been tempted three times, and he overcomes Satan. And when he overcomes Satan, and it's all over, and victory should be declared for Jesus... Do you know what Luke writes? Verse 13, chapter 4. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. (laughs) It doesn't end. Because Luke understands how life works. And he's not writing fairy tales. So knowing that about Luke, ending chapter 15 this way shouldn't surprise us. He's telling us something extremely significant. And so I want to start with verse 36, what Mr. Raymond read for us. I want to just read it again. After some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each city where we previously preached the word of the Lord to see how the new believers are doing, which, by the way, I think is a pretty gutsy statement, thinking of the abuse that they've taken, and it's Paul who says, let's go back there. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? You know? And Barnabas agreed and wanted to take along John Mark. Remember John Mark? He bailed on him the first time. I mean, they hadn't even got, you know, 15 feet into the trip when he went home to find Mama. But Paul disagreed strongly. Since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work, their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark and him and sailed for Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas, and he left. The believers entrusted him to the Lord's gracious care. And then he traveled throughout Syria and Cilicia, strengthening churches there. What is going on? Did these fellows just go crazy? It's been Barnabas and Paul for years. If it wasn't for Barnabas, Paul would have never met the apostles. Remember, they were afraid to meet him. It was Barnabas who went and got, when he was being called Saul, and he introduced him to the apostles. And then it was Barnabas when there was the riot and they were going to try to kill Paul, and so they put him over the wall, right, quietly at night, and he escaped back to his hometown of Tarsus, where the apostles basically benched him, because everywhere he went, there was a riot, and so he was just kind of left there to sit, 
It was Barnabas who was at Antioch in Syria in the midst of what I call a revival, amazing things going on, who leaves in the middle of a revival. By the way, there's not a preacher in the world that would leave in the middle of a revival. <laughs> Barnabas does. He leaves in the middle of a revival and he goes hunting for Tarsus. And it's not like he can track him down on Facebook. It takes a little while. <laughs> and he finds him and he brings him to Antioch of Syria where they teach together for a year and where he mentors Paul. And then they make a couple of other trips together and then they go on the road together. They endure all of this stuff together. Even when they strike out their first missionary journey, remember in the early days, it's Barnabas and Saul or Barnabas and Paul. It's only halfway through after Barnabas keeps pushing Paul forward and pushing Paul forward to speak, to do, to act, that it then becomes Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas doesn't seem to care that he gets second billing. And then boom, just like that. Paul splits with Barnabas. Why? Because John Mark had lost his nerve in abandoning them five years ago. It wasn't last week. It was five years prior. You know people grow up in five years, right? A lot can change in five years. And Barnabas, who was the one who got Paul his second shot, wants to give his nephew a second chance. Why? Because that's what encouragers do. Encouragers give people another chance. But for Paul, even Paul, the great apostle of the New Testament, who no one believes has ever sinned except maybe once, right? <laughs> John Mark's sin is somehow unforgivable in his mind. That's the long and the short of it. He cannot get past the fact that the kid tucked tail and ran. Paul. This is the Paul who used to be Saul. Who is partially responsible for the death of Stephen. Stephen. Who is responsible for believers, new believers being arrested, families being busted up, people being put in prison, some of them executed. It's that Saul. The Saul who will later on refer to him as the chief of sinners because he comes around in understanding who he is. But in this moment, for whatever reason, as crazy as it sounds, the kid bailing on them five years ago is the unforgivable sin. I know, I know, for some of you, I'm mm -hmm. coming to the edge because I'm talking bad about Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love him too. Okay? Right? But he's not next in line for the Trinity, okay? <laughs> I just want to make sure we're clear about that, right? <clears throat> You know, I can't say for certain because obviously I don't know what's in Paul's heart. But it seems to me that Paul has forgotten from whence he's come. Conveniently. <laughs> and for this moment in time, the only thing he can remember is that John Mark abandoned them. Well, if he'd pause and thought about it for a, member, a minute, he'd remember that his boss got by, betrayed by one, denied by two, and abandoned by all. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he said when he came out of the grave was, tell my brothers... He still claimed them as his brothers. Mm. 
And if any of that sounds familiar to you, it's only because you and me do it every single day. Every time we judge somebody, every time we have a critical thought about somebody else, every time we whisper a divisive, unkind word, every time we even just hold it in our head, every time we decide that we're just not going to associate with them because we don't approve of their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity. Here's one of the things that Luke is trying to tell us in Acts chapter 15 that I can attest to after 35 years of ministry. Some of the worst attacks come after the biggest successes. Mm. Mm. The moment you breathe and think, man, we really nailed it, that's when you really get nailed. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, yeah. mm. When you're spiritually tired and when you're emotionally tired and when you're physically tired, but you're thrilled because, look, we built the playground and the next day, bam, <laughs> this depression comes over you from somewhere you don't have a clue about. It's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. When the anxiety hits you in the middle of the night, right before you're going to go out and take food to people and speak the name of Jesus to them, it's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. You see, Luke is saying, this is how it is. Survive the temptations? Good. Thank God for that. But be ready because when the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity. A great sense of progress will come with a cascade of doubts and accusations. Why? That's how Satan operates. He and his minions are always on the attack. The more you and I hold on to our bitterness or our petty complaints against each other or our justifiable hatred or dislike, our refusal to forgive, the more we are open to attack. Mm. And Luke tells us that the opportunity for failure does not lag far behind mm -hmm. our great successes. Even if your name's Paul. Or Barnabas. If Paul and Barnabas can get in conflict that breaks up one of the most amazing partnerships in all of the scripture, what do you suppose Satan can do with us? Just remember this, okay? When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him till the next opportunity came. Hmm. And Luke's telling us there'll always be an opportunity. I hope you think about that, okay? Lord Jesus, I I don't want us to be afraid. I just want us to be aware. Yes. I don't want us to be timid. But I want us to be bold in you. And not in ourselves and our own abilities and our own strengths. And I want to ask, Holy Spirit, that you would give us all radar. Hmm. So that when we start getting sideways of one another, that we'll see it for what it really was, what it really is. The enemy waiting for the next opportunity. Hmm. 
Yes. As we seek and as we plead with you to change our community, to pour your spirit out on West Baltimore, we pray, O oh God, that you would change us so that we would become people who remember the good things done to us and for us. And our memory would become short when it comes to the things that are ugly and unkind and hurtful and leave scars. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let that be true of us. Mm -hmm. And help us not to grow weary in well-doing. Because in due season, we will reap a harvest if we only endure. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.